In section 1.2, we look at quadratic equations and applications. To put it simply, a quadratic equation is a second degree equation. The definition is here. A quadratic equation can be written in the form ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, where a, b, and c are real numbers, and the number a cannot be zero. The first way we learn how to solve quadratic equations is by factoring. This is by far the simplest way to solve quadratic equations. To do this, we use the zero product rule, which says that if the product of two numbers, c and d, is equal to zero, then either c has to be zero or d has to be zero. Now, this is something that probably most of you have had experience doing, so I am going to treat this like a form of review Let's do a few examples. In our first example, we're asked to solve 2x squared minus 7x plus 3 equals 0 by factoring. Let's spend a little time reviewing the factoring technique, since this is a vital skill to be successful in this class. Now, there are several different ways to factor this example. If you already know how to factor it, then you don't really need to listen to what I'm going to tell you here but I'm going to show you the magic x method once again. So if I multiply 2 times 3, that gives us positive 6. Then we take the middle number, negative 7. We'll write that in the bottom of our magic x. And now I'm looking for two numbers that I can multiply to get 6 and add to get negative 7. And those two numbers are negative 1 and negative 6. So now to factor this, I'm going to make two sets of parentheses. And we're going to start by just putting x in the front of each of these parentheses. And we're going to bring these two numbers over, negative 1 and negative 6. The vital step, though, is that if you have a number in front of x squared, you have to divide each of these by that number. Now, if you can't do the division, if you can't make a whole number here, we're going to take that bottom number and put it in front of the x. So that gives us 2x minus 1. But on the second one, notice that 6 divided by 2 is 3. So now we have it factored. We can then use the zero factor property, which says set each one of these factors equal to 0. So we have 2x minus 1 equals 0, or x minus 3 equals 0. Solving each one of these for x is going to yield positive 1 half and positive 3. And normally when you type these into a computer system, you'll just type in the answers separated by a comma or maybe in separate boxes. But those are our two solutions. In the next example, we have just another problem solving by factoring. I'm going to once again use the magic x method for factoring. I find this method to be really effective for a lot of students. So I'm going to multiply 5 times negative 2, which is negative 10. And the middle number is negative 3. And now I need to find two numbers that we can multiply to get negative 10 and add to get negative 3. And those two numbers are negative 5 and positive 2. So notice that negative 5 times 2 is negative 10, and negative 5 plus 2 is negative 3. All right, now on to the factoring. So we then make two sets of parentheses. We start with just the variable x, and we bring these two factors over to the parentheses. So minus 5 plus 2. And then again, the very important step here is that if you have a leading coefficient, you need to divide each one of these numbers by that coefficient. If you can do the division, go ahead and do it. So 5 divided by 5 is 1. But in the second one, 2 divided by 5 is not a whole number. So in this case, we bring the 5 in front of the x here, and we get 5x plus 2. We then set each factor equal to 0. And we solve. So in the first equation, we get x is equal to 1. 
And when you solve in the second equation, subtracting 2 and dividing by 5, you should end up getting negative 2 fifths. Now let's look at the principle of square roots. It states, if x squared is equal to c, and c is a non-negative number, then x must be the square root of c or the negative square root of c. All right, so an example of this, just real quick, is if x squared is equal to 25, then x would either be the square root of 25 or the negative square root of 25. And of course, that would be 5 or negative 5. All right, now let's take a look at the first example here. We're solving the equation negative 3x squared plus 9 is equal to 0. I can do this one of two different ways. The first way to do this is to just factor out the greatest common factor. Greatest common factor in this case is the number 3. And since we have a leading negative, I will pull the negative out as well. When I do that, we get x squared minus 3 left over. Now, the only way this product can equal 0 is if one of these two factors is 0. Well, negative 3 is never 0. However, x squared minus 3 could be 0. So we'll set that equal to 0. And then if we add 3 to both sides, we get x squared is equal to 3. And using the principles of square roots, we know that x has to be plus or minus the square root of 3. And this is one way to do it. Let me show you another way to do it. So if we start with our original equation, another way to approach this is to simply isolate x squared. So the first thing I can do here is subtract 9 from both sides. This gives us negative 3x squared is equal to negative 9. And then I can divide both sides by negative 3. And that gives us x squared is equal to 3. And now you see that we are in the same place here as we were over here, right? These are exactly the same. So at that point, we know x can be either positive or negative radical 3. Now, the plus or minus notation is a shorthand notation. So really, the answer should be written as the square root of 3 or negative square root of 3. But oftentimes, I will use this plus or minus notation as an abbreviation. Let's take a look at the next example. This problem is very similar, and we can do it a couple of different ways. I'm going to go ahead and factor out the 4, which gives us x squared minus 5. And then from there, we know that 4 is never equal to 0, but x squared minus 5 could be equal to 0. And then if we add 5 to both sides, we get x squared equals 5. And this means that x must be equal to positive or negative square root of 5. And those are our two answers. To do this next problem, we need to review the technique of completing the square. So we're going to solve this equation using this new technique called completing the square. So first of all, let's talk about perfect square trinomials. A perfect square trinomial is a trinomial that you get by squaring a particular binomial. So if we take, for example, x plus 5, quantity to the second power, we know this means x plus 5 times x plus 5. And if you multiply that out, you get x squared plus 10x plus 25. So I want you to notice that the 25 here is 5 times 5, and the 10 here is 5 plus 5. Anytime you have this phenomenon, you have a perfect square trinomial. So more generally, we could say that if you have x plus a, quantity to the second power, this is going to be x squared plus ax plus ax plus a squared, which is x squared plus 2ax 
plus a squared. And again, notice that the last number, a squared, is from a times a, and the number 2a is from a plus a. So this is always going to happen. So the question is, if I have a trinomial, how do I know that it's a perfect square? So consider this example. Say we have x squared plus 6x plus 9. Is that a perfect square trinomial? Well, it is. It is because 9 is 3 times 3, and 6 is 3 plus 3. So when I go to factor this, we know that it's going to be x plus 3 times x plus 3. And that's going to be x plus 3 quantity to the second power. All right. So let's look at another way to recognize when you have a perfect square trinomial. Here's another perfect square trinomial. x squared plus 14x plus 49. Another way to see that we have a perfect square trinomial is if we take this middle number 14 and divide it by 2 and then square that number. And when you do this, you should always get the last number. So notice that 14 divided by 2 is 7, and 7 squared indeed is 49. So now what we can do is we can actually complete the square. Suppose I gave you x squared plus 8x, and I asked you what number would you have to add here to complete the square? Well, the answer is you take the middle number 8, you divide it by 2, and you square it, and that gives us 16. So x squared plus 8x plus 16 would be a perfect square trinomial. And that's because if you then factor it, you would get x plus 4 times x plus 4, which is x plus 4 to the second power. What if we had x squared minus 5x? The question is, what would I have to add here to make this into a perfect square? Well, again, the answer is the same thing. You take the middle number, which in this case is negative 5, you divide it by 2, and you square it. And when you do this, you get positive 25 over positive 4. So x squared minus 5x plus 25 over 4 would be a perfect square trinomial. Now, this is less intuitive because we have a fraction here, but let's see about factoring it. Well, we know x squared comes from x times x, and we know that 25 over 4 comes from 5 over 2 multiplied by 5 over 2. And the fact that we have a negative here but a positive here indicates that we need a negative in both places. Now, that would be x minus 5 halves quantity squared. But is that right? Well, let's check. x times x is x squared. x times negative 5 halves is negative 5 halves x. Negative 5 halves times x is negative 5 halves x. And negative 5 halves times negative 5 halves is positive 25 over 4. Negative 5 halves plus negative 5 halves is negative 10 halves x, and that is negative 5x. So you can see we do indeed get the middle number in the end. Now let's apply this to solving the equation above. So first, to solve this equation, let's recognize that we have 3x squared minus 6x minus 1 is equal to 0. And the first thing you need to do when completing the square, I didn't mention this a minute ago, but the number in front of x squared must be equal to 1. So the very first thing I'm going to do, since I need 1 here, is I'm going to divide everything by 3, both sides of the equation. This gives us x squared minus 2x minus 1 third is equal to 0. Now, what I need to do is complete the square. This number right here is the wrong number to have. So we're going to add that number over to the other side, just to get it out of the way. And now I'm going to go through the completing the square process. 
which says take the middle number, in this case negative 2, divide it by 2, and square it. And this gives us positive 1. So I need to add 1 to both sides of the equation. This should complete the square. Now if we take it from here, what I have on the left-hand side when I factor it is x minus 1 times x minus 1. On the right-hand side, 1 third plus 1 is 4 thirds. And now, sure enough, we have x minus 1 quantity to the second power is equal to 4 thirds. Now, the significance of this is that on the left-hand side, we have a perfect square. So I can now take the square root of both sides. That's going to give us x minus 1 is equal to plus or minus. Now, square root of 4 over 3 is the square root of 4 over the square root of 3, which is 2 over radical 3. And we can rationalize this by multiplying by radical 3 over radical 3. And that gives us 2 radical 3 over 3. Okay, so that's just a simplification of that. And now to solve for x, I'm just going to add 1 to both sides. And that gives us x equals 1 plus or minus 2 radical 3 over 3. You can leave your answer like this, but generally speaking, we want to get a common denominator. So we change 1 to be 3 over 3. And then adding the numerators, we get 3 plus or minus 2 radical 3 over 3. 3. And again, let's keep in mind that there are two answers there. One answer is 3 plus 2 radical 3 over 3. The other answer is 3 minus 2 radical 3 over 3. Now, the method of completing the square is not a simple method. So it's going to take a little bit of practice to get good at this. Next, we talk about the quadratic formula. If you're solving a quadratic equation, ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0, where a is not equal to 0, we can use this thing called the quadratic formula to solve. Now, the quadratic formula tells us that x is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, all divided by 2a. I imagine most of you have probably heard of this formula before. You need to memorize this formula. It's very important. But what I want to do for you here is derive the formula. I would like to show you where it comes from. So we start with the equation ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. And I'm going to divide everything by a. Now, when we do this, we get x squared plus b over a times x plus c over a equals 0 divided by a is 0. Now, what I'm going to do is complete the square. So, first of all, we need to take this positive c over a and move it to the other side. This gives us x squared plus b over a times x is equal to negative c over a right, because we have to subtract it from both sides. Now to complete the square, we're going to take the middle number, which is b over a, and we're going to divide it by 2. Now, dividing this number by 2 is not very practical, so instead I'm going to multiply it by 1 half, right, that's the same as dividing it by 2, and then we're going to square that. And when we do that, we get b over 2a quantity squared. And that is b squared over 4a squared. I'm going to add that number to both sides of the equation. Now, on the right-hand side, we need to simplify this. So if I just multiply the top and bottom of that fraction by 4a, notice that we get negative 4a times c over 4a times a, which is 4a squared, plus b squared over 4a squared. Combining these together to get a common denominator, I can write this as b squared minus 4ac divided by 4a squared. All right, 
So now our equation, if I take it from here, on the right-hand side, we have b squared minus 4ac, all divided by 4a squared. On the left-hand side, we have x squared plus b over a times x plus b squared over 4a squared. When we factor this, we get x and x, we get positive and positive, and we get b over 2a and b over 2a. And that's because b over 2a times b over 2a is b squared over 4a squared. This now gives us x plus b over 2a quantity squared equals, and then on the right-hand side, we have the same thing. From here, we take the square root of both sides, and we get x plus b over 2a is equal to plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by the square root of 4a squared. Sorry, this should be a square here. And now we can subtract b over 2a from both sides. And that is going to give us x is equal to negative b over 2a plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over the square root of 4a squared is 2a. And now if we combine that into a single fraction, we get negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all divided by 2a. And this is the quadratic formula. Now, I show you this just so if you're curious where it comes from, this is where it comes from. You don't have to know how to derive this formula, but it is really important for you to memorize this formula. So again, back to the beginning here, it's really important for you to know this formula. This is the quadratic formula, and it is used to solve quadratic equations. All right. Now let's take a look at some examples. In this example, we're asked to solve negative 4x squared plus 3x plus 1 half is equal to 0. You can use the quadratic formula to solve this equation. In other words, you can identify that a is equal to negative 4, b is equal to 3, and c is equal to 1 half, and then plug all those numbers into the formula. Nothing wrong with this, but plugging in a fraction is never really a great idea. Sometimes you can get away with it, and here it probably wouldn't be a big problem, but it's always best to just plug in whole numbers. So what I'm going to do before I apply the quadratic formula here is I'm going to get rid of that fraction, and I'm actually also going to get rid of the negative in the front here, and I'm going to do that by multiplying both sides by negative 2. Now let's take a look at what happens when we multiply by negative 2. Multiplying here, we get positive 8x squared. Multiplying here, we get negative 6x. And multiplying here, we get negative 1. And on the right-hand side, 0 times negative 2 is still 0. Now I can take the values a equals 8, b equals negative 6, and c equals negative 1, and plug all those into the quadratic formula. So when we do that, we get x is equal to negative negative 6, plus or minus the square root of negative 6 quantity squared, minus 4 times 8 times negative 1, all divided by 2 times 8. Now, in case you don't know what I'm doing here, I'm taking a equals 8, b equals negative 6, and c equals negative 1, and I'm plugging those into these variables in the appropriate places. Okay, so you can pause if you want and double check that I've done that correctly. Now let's go ahead and simplify. Negative negative 6 is 6. 
Inside the radical here, we have negative 6 quantity squared, which is positive 36. And then negative 4 times 8 times negative 1 is positive 32. And in the denominator, we have 16. This is equal to 6 plus or minus the square root of 68 divided by 16. And for the square root of 68, we can reduce that by thinking of it as square root of 4 times the square root of 17. So that is 2 radical 17. Now, the last thing I can do, since all of these numbers are divisible by 2, I can divide them all by 2, and that gives us 3 plus or minus radical 17 divided by 8. And so we have two answers, 3 plus radical 17 over 8 and 3 minus radical 17 over 8. Another thing we can do with the quadratic formula is we can use the part of the quadratic formula under the square root sign, which is the b squared minus 4ac expression. And this is called the discriminant. And we can use that to determine the types of solutions that we have. So remember, if you're taking the square root of b squared minus 4ac, we can decide what kind of answer we're going to have by looking at what is the square root of that number. So if b squared minus 4ac is positive, we will have two distinct real solutions because we're taking the square root of a positive number. If b squared minus 4ac is 0, the square root of 0 is 0, and we will only get one real solution. And if that discriminant is negative, we will have no real solutions because we will then be taking the square root of a negative number. And when you take the square root of a negative number, you get non-real solutions, which are called complex numbers. All right, and we'll be talking about those in a little bit. Let's take a look at this example. Use the quadratic formula to find the real solutions of the equation negative 2t squared plus 3t is equal to 5. So first, let's write it down. Second thing you need to know is to use the quadratic formula or the discriminant, you must have your quadratic equation equal to 0. So I am going to subtract 5 from both sides. And then from there, I can identify that a is negative 2, b is positive 3, and c is negative 5. And let's go ahead and take a look at the discriminant. The discriminant is b squared minus 4ac. b squared is 3 squared, and then minus 4 times a, a is negative 2, and c is is negative 5. If you do the math here, you get 9, and then negative times negative times negative is negative, and 8 times 5 is 40. 9 take away 40 is negative 31. So the discriminant is negative. When this happens, we get no real solutions. Because if you try to solve this, you would be taking the square root of a negative number. So for example, if you apply the quadratic formula here, you will end up getting negative 3 plus or minus the square root of negative 31 divided by negative 4. We can't do this in the real number system. These are non-real, okay? meaning they are complex numbers. All right? And that means we'll be talking about i, right? i is the imaginary root. All right, so this equation has no real solutions. Next, I would like to use the quadratic model to model the height of a baseball in flight. So here it says that 
The height of a ball after being thrown vertically upward from a point 80 feet above ground with a velocity of 40 feet per second is given by h equals negative 16 t squared plus 40 t plus 80, where t is the time in seconds since the ball was thrown and h is in feet. So the first question, part A, when will the ball be 50 feet above the ground? So when is the height equal to 50? So to do this, remember height is negative 16 t squared plus 40 times t plus 80. So if I want to know when the height is going to be 50, I'm going to plug in h equals 50. So that gives us 50 equals negative 16 t squared plus 40 t plus 80. Now we want to solve for t. I could do this by subtracting 50 from both sides. This gives us 0 equals negative 16 t squared plus 40 t plus 30. And now to solve this equation, I'll just use the quadratic formula. Let me identify that a is negative 16, b is positive 40, and c is positive 30. Remember the quadratic formula is t equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. So in this case, t will be negative 40 plus or minus the square root of 40 squared minus 4 times negative 16 times 30, all divided by 2 times negative 16. This is equal to negative 40 plus or minus the square root of 1600. And then now we need to multiply negative 4 times negative 16 times 30. And if you multiply those out, you end up getting positive 1920, all divided by negative 32. Let's keep going. We have negative 40 plus or minus the square root of 1600 plus 1920 is 3520 divided by negative 32. And now we need to take that square root on a calculator. And when we do that, we get negative 40 plus or minus 59.3296. That's an approximation over negative 32. And that's going to give us two answers. One answer will come from doing the plus sign, and one answer will come from doing the minus sign. So let me go ahead and do the plus sign first. That's going to give us negative 0 0.604. Or the other answer, if I do the plus sign, is going to give us... 3.104. Now, negative time doesn't make sense in this, re in this uh, problem. So the answer is the ball will be 50 feet above ground 3.104 seconds after it is thrown in the air. All right, let's look at the second part. Part B says, when will the ball reach the ground? Well, when it reaches the ground, the height of the ball is zero. So to do this, I need to substitute h equals zero, which gives us zero equals negative 16 t squared plus 40 t plus 80. And I might be able to solve this by factoring. We could give it a try. Something looks promising about this. If I pull out a negative eight, we get 2t squared minus 5t minus 10. And then we could try factoring from here. Actually, now that I think about it, if we try a magic x, 2 times negative 10 is negative 20. Negative 5 in the bottom. Are there any factors of negative 20 that add up to negative 5? And I don't think so, right? Negative 20 times 1 doesn't work. 
negative 20 times 2, negative 5 times 4, none of those add up to negative 5. So I take that back. This does not factor. However, because I did go ahead and factor out the negative 8, we could use these numbers in our quadratic formula because, again, it's still set equal to 0. So let's use those since they're a little bit smaller. T is going to be negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c, all divided by 2 times a. So again, this is a here, this is b, and this is c. Simplifying, we get positive 5 plus or minus the square root of 25 plus 80 divided by 4, right? So I'm doing negative 5 squared is 25. Negative 4 times 2 times negative 10 is positive 80. And this gives us 5 plus or minus the square root of 105 divided by 4. And we get two answers there, 5 plus the square root of 105 over 4, or 5 minus the square root of 105 over 4. And if we plug both of those into a calculator, we get 3.812 or negative 1.312. Again, negative time doesn't make sense. So it means it's going to take 3.812 seconds for the ball to hit the ground. All right, now let's think about the last question. The last question says, for what values of t does this problem make sense? Okay, so let's think about what's going on. Here's the ground. We are throwing the ball straight up into the air, but from a height of 80 feet above ground. So we're already 80 feet above ground. The ball gets thrown straight up into the air and then comes down and hits the ground. So in part A, we asked the question, when will it be 50 feet above ground? And we found the time for that. And then we asked, when will it hit the ground? And we found the time for that. And those were both a little over three seconds. But the question here is, for what values of t does this problem make sense? Well, it only makes sense for when you throw the ball into the air. And you throw the ball into the air at t equals zero. So for part c, the only values for t that this makes sense is for t greater than or equal to zero. So those negative time values that we got in part A and part B, they don't make sense because that would indicate that you're going back in time, right? And the ball wasn't even thrown in the air until time was equal to zero. So that's why t must be greater than or equal to zero in this problem. For our last example, the mobility rate, which is the percentage of people who changed residence for the years 2000 through 2016 can be modeled by the equation given here. T is the number of years since 2000. So the question is, in what year between 2000 and 2016 was the mobility rate 12%? All right. So what we're really asking here is, when was Y equal to 12%? Now, since the mobility rate is understood to be a percentage, for this problem, that just means that y is going to be 12. So if we plug this into the equation, we get 12 is equal to 0 0.0072t squared plus 0 0.0766t plus 11.318. And now to solve for t, first thing I need to do is subtract 12 to set this equal to 0. When we do that, we get 0 equals all this. And then 11.318 minus 12 is 0 0.682. So I just need to solve this equation now. And to do this, I'm going to apply the quadratic formula with a equals this number, b equals this number, and c equals this number. 
Oh, and by the way, this last number should be negative. There we go. So we get t is equal to negative 0 0.0766 plus or minus the square root of 0 0.0766 quantity squared minus 4 times 0 0.0072 times negative 0 0.682. Okay, so there's a lot going on there. We're going to have to type all that into a calculator. Let me go ahead and do that now. Oh, sorry, I got divided by 2a, forgot that part. Now let me go plug it into a calculator. And we get 5.772 or negative 16.411. Again, time can't be negative. T is the number of years since 2000. So T is going to be 2000 plus 5.772. So that's 2000 and 5.772. So we're going to round this to the nearest whole year, so that would be 2006.